Hey guys, I'm Mark. Today I am somewhere very special. Right behind me is the Bishop's Garden, which is the main garden of an iconic landmark here in the United States. Right back there is the Washington National Cathedral. And here with me today is Paul Ash, who is the director of the National Bell Festival. And he is going to show us the bells inside of this incredible structure. Paul, would you like to elaborate on that a little <laughs> bit and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, so here in Washington, uh, we work to restore historic bells and bell towers, mm -hmm. getting more bells ringing in more places. Um, and we celebrate that success on New Year's Day. So by literally ringing in the new year, creating yeah. a canopy of sound over Washington um, and across the country. And then this year, uh, we'll have a ring around the world as well. So starting in Australia at midnight, ringing in each time zone or most time zones as we move across um, the continents. That's incredible. Are you going to try to get that live streamed or videoed? We'd love to. Somehow? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be wonderful. That's gonna that's gonna take a lot more of a, a lot more choreography and getting things together and just exactly. right than uh, than what we're trying to work with today. But uh, I I can't wait for that. I think that's gonna be incredible. Yeah. So where are we going to be taking a look at today? Uh, so behind us is the Glory and Excelsis Tower. It's the main tower here at Washington National Cathedral. Mm -hmm. it stands 301 feet above okay. where we're standing right now. Um, so. Also where we're standing is the highest point mound in Washington. So it's a really massive piece of infrastructure and architecture that overlooks the entire city. Wow, and the entire city can see it too. It's just stand, it just yeah. stands all the way up at the top of the hill. Exactly. It looks over <laughs> everything around all of Washington. Which makes the bells resound even farther. <laughs> oh yeah, I didn't think about that. That's a great point. Okay, well, um, let's hear a little bit about the church itself. Uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Sure. So I know it was, it was started right around the turn of the century in 1907. I read that it was basically broke ground with President Theodore Roosevelt, and then I guess got wrapped up or sort of finished with President George H.W. Bush. Yeah, so cathedrals and construction projects like these take decades, yeah. if not centuries. Yeah, 80, um, 83 years, yeah. that's, a, that's that span, incredible. Um, so during that time, they added a lot of really awesome features. Uh, uh, the one that I'm most excited about is obviously the bell tower. Sure. Um, the bells were cast in 1962, they were installed 1963 and the tower itself was dedicated in 1964. Okay. Um, it's covered in Indiana limestone, the entire structure behind us. That's pretty uh, quick even for something that's, I mean, for something that size, that is, that's fast. Yes, a couple monumental. Of years. I mean, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, but the, the kind of, the speed is reflective in the grandeur as well. It almost kind of lifts above the ground. Yeah. Uh, the buttresses seem to almost fly in the air. The very lightweight architecture yeah. for being such a heavy material. Yeah. And it's uh, it's limestone. You said Kentucky Correct. limestone. Yeah. Okay. Indiana. Kentucky, Indiana. Yeah. Indiana limestone. <laughs> All right. And it's not painted or anything. It's just Correct. exposed limestone. Yeah. Gorgeous. So you might also notice some of the scaffolding. Um, uh -huh. So about a decade back, we had a not very good earthquake here in Washington. Um, which sent obviously a lot of, of buildings in need of repair from the Washington Monument all the way up to the cathedral. Mm -hmm. And so the scaffolding has been there ever since as stonemasons and workers um, try to get the cathedral back in safe position, but also in its, its original beauty. Now that I can imagine would take some time because Correct. you've got to assemble the right amount of people yeah. that know the, the right, right skills. amount of skills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they, these people aren't exactly in the yellow pages. Right. So <laughs> yeah, to track them down it's and get everybody world. together. Yeah. I wonder what the... Uh, who's in charge of that whole project. That's gotta be an incredible job. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, how about, uh, how about we take a walk around and maybe you can show us up in the tower itself. Love that.
All right, guys, this is Rob Bannister, and he is the one that's going to be ringing the bells today that we're going to be listening to while we're outside of the bell tower, but we're going to go up and see the bells, and he's going to be the one ringing them when they are ringing. One of the sense. 10 in the band today. One of the 10. Right. Okay. And you say it's the peel bell? Yeah, th there are two sets of bells in the cathedral. There's a carillon, and then we ring um, the 10 peel bells that hang above the carillon. So there's one okay. person that pulls um, the rope attached to each of the 10 bells. I see. So, Do you have a name for your specific bell that you ring? or? Well, today that? I'll be ringing the tenor, which is the... Okay happens to be the heaviest bell in North America. It's about 3,600 pounds. Oh, wow. Um, but the, the bells are mounted on wheels, so um, once you get the bell going, the momentum does a lot, most of the work. <laughs> so you, probably, you have to time it and you know, understand the feeling of the rope and all that as it goes? Exactly. It probably takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of practice and it, it takes um, typically several months for a learner to learn how to handle the rope safely so they don't get yeah. tangled up in yeah. it. <laughs> learning the ropes, is that what, uh, learning, that's the what learning the ropes, okay. Exactly. How, so how long have you been doing this? Since 2008, I learned in Miami and I've been okay. ringing in Washington since 2000, uh, actually 2004, I started Miami, 2008 in Washington. Okay. And we also ring at the old post office tower down on Pennsylvania Avenue. So you guys get around a little bit. Yep. There's only so many people that know how to do this, I'd assume, in the country. That's right. There's only um, about maybe 50 bell towers in the U.S. and Canada that have peel bells. Um, so, yeah, it's a small number. So most, most cathedrals or, or churches would have automated bells or ones that are geared a certain way? Or these, the peel bells are manually pulled and there's only so many of those? Right. And some of those 50 um, towers are located at... Um, say universities, mm -hmm. um, most of them are at churches, but um, for example, the old post office tower is a secular building as well. So, um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for explaining with us what you do. We can't wait to hear the sounds. Hope you enjoy. We'll be ringing a method called Grand Circaders. Grand Circaders. Right. Okay. Awesome. Well, okay. I look forward to hearing it. Great. All right, Rob. So now we are in the peel court. What do you call this room? This is the ringing room the for ringing the peel room. bells. The ringing room for the peel bells. So these are the ropes that you guys pull in order to make the peel bells ring. Right. All right. Now how high up are we right now off of the ground, this room? We're probably about 200 feet up. Yeah. And maybe another 20 feet um, right above us is where the peel bells are mounted. That's where the bells themselves are. Mm -hmm. Now these are manually operated bells from the sense that they're, they're controlled with actual ropes and each rope has to have a human on the end of it. Right, we're the only musicians that don't see our instruments while we play them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got a ceiling up there, that's true. But you learn to feel how they are, right? Exactly, there's a lot of feedback as to where the bell is in its path. Um, it swings uh -huh. 360 degrees and we can feel what the, the force that's at the other end of the rope um, with our hands. So yeah. a lot of people ask, you know, don't you wear gloves while you're ringing because you can get blisters and nobody does that because you want that feedback. You want that sensitivity. So I see you got where you actually grab onto the ropes will be these blue things. Um, oh. for, for one of the strokes, there's two strokes okay. um, when you ring the peel bells. The hand stroke mm -hmm. where you um, put your hands on what this is called the sally. All right. And then there's the backstroke. Um, so when the bell, when you swing the bell, it wraps around the wheel. So it goes pretty high up. Yeah, it'll, 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 my hands will be pulled all the way upwards. All the way up to there, at the end of that. Right, and okay. then when I pull it, I'm pulling the backstroke. Uh -huh. And then the rope will come back down through the ceiling and then I'll grab the sally to do okay. the hand stroke. All right. And then um, when I pull the sally, it'll, uh, the rope will go into the ceiling and wrap around the wheel and then up and back to the backstroke. Okay. Where are you holding the most weight in this process? Like what's the most, uh, the toughest on your muscles if there were a position or is it all pretty much equal by the way it's balanced out? Um, well, the momentum um, does most of the work. Um, you can f feel the, the bell the most as it's going up to okay. the, the balance, that's where you're gonna feel um, the resistance. And when you, you pull, then the momentum swings it around and then up again. And it so it pulls you back up again right. with it. Yeah. Okay. 
Interesting. So to give you a, a demonstration, the bell right now is in the mouth downward position. Mm -hmm. So um, you'd always test before you pull a rope that it is in fact in the down position because before you raise a bell, you're gonna make coils with the rope like this and pull. So, you, so it, that as it goes, you can let it <laughs> unwind yeah, out of your hand. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to demonstrate pretty quickly. This is the number three bell, which is 712 pounds. So you're swinging it back and forth and getting the momentum up right now is what you're doing? Exactly. Okay. So little by little, the bell's gonna start making a full circle. And when the bell gets to <laughs> the balance point where it's ringing the full 360 degrees, that is um, a skill that takes months often to learn how to balance the bell so that it doesn't try to swing in the, all the way around. So for example, here, it's at the balance point. Okay. There, balance point. And now it's set. So the bell's in the mouth upward position. Okay. But um, underneath the bell, there's a piece of wood that comes down and it's perpendicular with what we call the slider. So it's probably easier to explain that when you can see it. But we can leave the bell standing like this and when we start a performance, all the bells are in this position, and then we all pull off in order. So One, they two, fall, three. they all fall in? Yes. Okay. So we always start by ringing in order until the rhythm settles, and then um, when the rhythm is sounding good, we're all equally spaced in, in how we're striking. The conductor, who's one of the ringers, will say go, and they'll say the name of the method, and then we know how we're supposed to change the order in which we ring. So we'll no longer be ringing in order one through 10. One by one, we'll move into a different position. You can only mm -hmm. um, change the order in which your bell is ringing one place at a time. So for that reason, we can't um, play tunes because um, you can't move, um, can't change the order in which say the tenor, which is 3,600 pounds, <laughs> you can only adjust the speed in which it rings right. very um, incrementally. So we just change the order one place at a time. Because you got the momentum, it's swinging at what it wants to swing at. It's not yeah. gonna go any faster or slower right away just because you want it to. Exactly. Does it, take, does, it, does it take one person to learn one bell or does one person learn all the bells? I assume that they're different from one to the next in terms of how they feel, is that true? Like yes, the because weight of, of the, weight. the weight, but essentially, we're all doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, once you learn how to ring a bell, it's, you can ring any of the bells, but it may take a lot more effort um, for a heavier bell. And it takes a different kind of skill. With a heavier bell, um, you have to be um, much more intentional with controlling the speed if you want to speed it up or slow it down because um, the bell you know, like you were saying earlier, you can only change the speed of the bell so much. Whereas yeah. on a smaller bell, if it's really light, and the lightest bell here is 600 pounds, but I've been in other <laughs> towers where, you know, the bells are much lighter. So um, you have to have a lot more finesse with, I actually find it more, diff more um, of a challenge ringing the lighter bells because you have to handle the rope with such precision. Yeah. Because if you over pull, you know, it could, that those pieces of wood I mentioned can smack each other and potentially break, which oh. would not be good. Um, or it, if it doesn't break, it could bounce back down and come down quickly. So um, that requires a different kind of skill. But um, having said that, it's the same motions. You have the backstroke, the hand stroke, um, and the bells, change ringing bells will be the same in any tower you go in North America or overseas, um, you can grab a rope and it may take you a few minutes to adjust your hands so you know how high to place your hands or where to have the, the tail end of the rope. But they're pretty much hands. all set up identical, yep. all the same way. Yep. What keeps them from, now when you're, you're pulling this rope right now, are they locked in some sort of way that keeps them from actually ringing? Are they ringing when you were doing that? Or um, this one bell, or I mean? Well, we have, you're right, we, we have a mechanism 
um, inside the, the bell that keeps the clapper in the center so it doesn't hit the side. So it's a piece of wood that holds the clapper in place. Okay. And beca because um, we don't want people outside to hear the bells ringing haphazardly <laughs> during mm -hmm. this demonstration, we sure. have. So you have to go up there and physically install yep. that piece of wood? Yep. Just for the, and I guess you do the same thing if you're training somebody how to feel the ropes, to learning the ropes, right? I mean, exactly, yeah, to um, spare our neighbors the pain of hearing people learning. Sure. When we practice here uh, once a week, um, we have the silencers, which is the piece of wood we put in the bell, okay. installed um, during the practice until they um, reach a level of competence with the ringing that um, it sounds a little better. Yeah. Well, and I guess it depends on where the bell tower is too. Right. If you've got one that's way on the outside of town versus one that's dead center where we are in the middle of Washington, D.C. Exactly. Um, you're not just going to want to let the amateurs practice there. Right. That's fantastic. Well, you said you've been doing this for a number of years. Um, have, you, have you gauged a, a feel for what you like more certain certain churches or certain bells have some become more uh i don't know more of a friend to you where you play or you know i guess you know what i'm trying to say yeah um well those of us who ring at national cathedral it's a real privilege to ring mm -hmm. here for for many reasons but one of which is this is a beautiful set of bells is um they, they sound wonderful the way they're hung the bells go easy we say that um, they're not oddly struck or there can be some bell towers where you go where the bells aren't perfectly, um, you know, aligned over the years. Things can, you know, sure. start to move and they're not smooth anymore. Yeah, they might be a little more finicky. So, so there's a little bit more calibrated or it's 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 true to form. Right. What you would expect. Right. And right. as you can see, it's quite spacious here oh, um, yeah. but in most bell towers it's a very small confined space and mm -hmm. you might almost have your back up to the wall or you might have a railing in your in your back like where yeah. i learned the ring in miami um so you know we're fortunate in that sense a lot of natural light this looks like quite the place to i mean you got a looks like quite the place to hang out you got a coffee table you got chairs i mean you guys got your own <laughs> looks like little club up here yeah. the elite club the ringers of uh the washington national cathedral right yeah, there's not too many people in the world that get to see the inside of this room, I would imagine. No, um, but if, if you know anyone that might be interested, there are, um, they're called tower climbs. Okay. Um, at least once a year or twice a year. You'll um, actually do a tour? Yeah, tours are conducted. Through. and um, But normally you have to climb all the way up the spiral staircase uh, rather okay. than go in the elevator. So. Like we did, because we only have a little group here. Right. But if you're given a tour, yeah, sorry, you got to walk. <laughs> right. Well, I feel lucky. <laughs> All right. Well, would you like to go up and uh, sure. show off the bells? Yep. Awesome. Well, let's go up. So this is the simplest method that we ring called plain hunt. In this case, it's on eight bells. So we start out all ringing in order, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We continue ringing that order until the, the rhythm settles down and we're equally spaced. And then the conductor would say, go plain hunt on eight. So then... Everybody starts moving. All the even bells would move one place down in the sequence. All the odd bells would move one place up in the sequence. For example, whoever's ringing the I number see. one bell um, would then ring in the seconds place. The next time they pull the rope, they're going to be in thirds place. The next time they pull the rope, fourth place, etc., until they get out to ace place. Then they ring behind, we say, in ace place for two um, pulls of the rope, and then they work their way back in until they finish where they started in the first position. Since everybody is doing the same exact thing, um, we'll, we'll all end up back in the same order, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, it's amazing. So it that's the simplest method, but it gets a whole lot more complicated. <laughs> if you, There's an infinite number of methods where you could do something we call dodging, where you could be one, two, three, four, three, four, five, six, five, six, seven, eight, seven, or it, you know, goes from there. <laughs> is, it, is this the entire method, or do once you get to the bottom, do you start back at the top again, or is this, this is the, the, whole... the entire method? So right. it, it only takes uh, a couple of minutes to ring. Okay. Um, but if we were to add some permutations in here, mm -hmm. um, 
that would lengthen how long it would take. So it could be that for a method, it could take about 15 minutes during all the possible changes in that method without a conductor calling out an instruction that would have a few bells, make one small um, tweak to the order in which they ring, and such that all of us could keep ringing that same method without repeating the order in which we rang previously. Um, and that could, the conductor could keep doing that such that for a full peel on 10 bells, we would each of each person um, ringing the band would pull their ropes in a different order for more than 5,000 pulls of the rope. And that would take uh, mm. between three, three and a half hours. That's amazing. Yeah. I'll never repeating the order. I'll bet you're tired after that. Yeah. Mentally um, and physically. <laughs> so, the, so the math changes, and these change a lot depending upon, I would assume you'd always, for the most part, want to have an even number of bell ringers. Does that open up possibilities in terms of the methods that you can play? Yeah, it sounds better um, with an even number of bells, but we do have methods that we ring that have an odd number of bells. In that case, we would try to have um, one person ringing behind, we say. So today, for example, we rang an odd bell method. It was nine bells, and mm -hmm. I was ringing the tenor. So I rang in the tenth position the entire time while the other nine bells were changing the order. But it sounds better to have someone on that 10th bell than to ring without the 10th bell and have an odd number of bells. Hmm. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I guess, pretty close to math or one of the closest things you get to math, I would assume. Or yeah. it's using music and math together um, in such a way that I've just never seen before. Yeah, the, it, the, uh, chain ringing seems to attract uh, an outsized uh, number of people who do um, like computer modeling and, and math oh, okay. and tracks. Uh, and a lot of librarians, people that like to impose order on things. Um, okay. There's a certain beauty to huh. the order in which we ring and, and arriving back to where we started. So The order of things. Well, that's, that's amazing. I, I like seeing it laid out like this. It just makes it so much simpler. Are the larger, um, or it makes it easier to comprehend. I don't know if simple is the right word, at least not for me. Uh, standing back there while you guys are ringing, can, do you guys ever glance at this to remember where you're at, or does everybody need to know? I mean, you, everyone needs to know. Yeah, before um, you start ringing, then this yeah. is what we're going to play. Everybody stares at it for a second, or I mean, what's the? Well, it's kind of like when you learn a language. Um, mm -hmm. You start off learning how to conjugate very simple verbs and very simple sentences, mm -hmm. and then. As you continue studying the language, you increase your vocabulary, you learn the past tense, the future tense, and you, but you don't start out speaking, mixing all those tenses up with a huge vocabulary. You do things in steps and you build upon right. that. So for someone who's learning change ringing, they would start out learning the simplest method, plain hunt. And so, buddy, and so would everybody else too. So your, uh, your chain is, is, is assembled according to its link, weakest link, I guess. That's right. right? Um, Your I method mean, can only be as complicated as, as the, um, the most amateur of, of ringers. That's exactly right. Um, and all of us here have been ringing at different levels of experience. Mm -hmm. I'm a relatively newer ringer because I've only been <laughs> ringing for 17 years because we have ringers that have been only ringers 17. who were in their 70s that um, learned how to ring when they were in high school oh, um, wow. at this cathedral girls school. So. Um, the longer you've been ringing, the, the steadier you are, the more knowledgeable you are, and the better able you are to help the learners um, find their way back in place if they get lost. Helping people. Right. Okay. It's like, it's, it's like a, I guess, football or baseball or anything else, too. It's certain sports, is the, uh, the veterans know how to guide the younger people, and they know what to watch for. Yeah, and this is definitely a team activity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it feels like such a triumph when you're able to ring a whole peel because most peel attempts collapse because um, it's mentally taxing to stay focused on the, the method that you're ringing and stay in place for mm -hmm. you know, three plus hours. And sometimes people fall out of place and that may cause a change reaction that you can't recover from and then you stand your bells and even if, like I've been in a peel attempt where we were about more than three hours into it and um, 
it collapsed about 10 minutes from the end, oh. and it doesn't count. It's kind of like ring, oh, running a marathon, but only 25 miles. It doesn't count unless oh, you've done wow. the whole 26.2. <laughs> That's amazing. But when you achieve it together, something everyone feels good about, and you know, no one um, criticizes anyone that may have caused the chain reaction to, sure. because well, we've all been at fault at one point or another. Sure. And there's a beauty in it too and a pride of being able to get it back together and getting back on its wheels again. Yep. Um, and you can't, you can't just stop in the middle of it to have a conversation and figure it out. Or use the bathroom uh, or, use, or get yeah, a drink of water. <laughs> You're locked into it. Well, that's fantastic. I heard one story of a ringer that was in a peel attempt and a mouse was crawling down the bell rope while people were ringing and landed on <laughs> someone's head and, um, you know, got down to the floor and scurried off, but they didn't miss a beat. <laughs> that deserves an award. That's, that's awesome. That's wonderful. Okay, well, you want to go up, I uh, assume, up these stairs here where yep. the bells are at? Yep, let's yeah. do it. Well, let's go up, take a look. There, there have been some um, peels, long length peels are called, that have gone uh -huh. for like 14 or more hours where they're ringing like a large number of, of methods. 14 um, or yeah, more hours. if you can imagine, I can't imagine. I, I can't imagine that either. All right, Rob, so this is the smallest bell and then the largest bell in the room. Right, this is 608 pounds and then okay. they increase in weight as you go around the circle, each bell um, has a different note until you get to the largest bell, the 10, which is 3,588 pounds. 3,500 pounds and 88 pounds. That's amazing. Right. How do they get these up here in the first place? They bring them in with a crane? With a crane, I believe they brought them through the roof where you see. There's a hatch up there. Right. And then <laughs> the bells of the carillon went through the center of the, uh, the floor here, down through the ringing chamber and um, below the ringing chamber. Wow, so they all came in through the roof. Yeah, and these were imported from the White Chapel Bell Foundry in, in London mm. that had been in an operation for hundreds of years until just recently um, closed down. Oh, wow. Um, but if you want to walk this way, I'll show you the contrast sure. between these bells, uh, nine of the 10 bells are in the mouth downward position. Um, but this bell I rang up and we say that this bell is um, standing and you have this piece of wood called the stay okay. that is leaning against another piece of wood perpendicularly. That's called the slider. Sure. So when the ringer in the ringing room pulls the rope, the bell will swing this way. Well, which way does the wheel turn? Does the wheel turn? It'll turn this way. The wheel, turn, well, the wheel will turn like this. Right, okay. so it'll turn 360 degrees and then change direction and, and uh, turn 360 degrees the other way. And it always stops when it's facing straight down. Right, um, unless you have an inexperienced ringer who pulls their rope too hard such that these two pieces of wood come in contact and one of the two breaks. And it'll just go all the way around? And then it'll keep going around and it'll pull the rope right out of the hands of the ringer, for, hopefully, if the ringer's lucky, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it'll come right through the ceiling. Um, so that's part of the learning process, learning to pull the rope with enough energy that you get the bell swinging the full 360 degrees but not yeah. with too much energy such that these two pieces of wood really come into uh, hard contact and one or the other breaks. But is it typical to make contact just a little bit? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And this slider will slide back. It has about a one foot range of motion. So typically the... So it does give you a little bit of give. Yeah. And There's the wood is typically ash, which has a little bit more give than say mm -hmm. oak. Sure. Ash, that's what they make baseball bats out of. Mm -hmm. There's our second sports reference yep. of the, uh, for our little tour. All yeah. right. And this is in a very dangerous uh, position right here. You don't let too many people up here, especially with a bell facing upwards. Cause... Exactly. If you, you got close and someone were to lean against the bell and it would start swinging. Yeah. Um, You're not stopping. Yeah, this is 712 pounds. So, um, you know. Yeah, uh, you're, you're, not, not you're, not, you're not slowing that down. Right. Okay. Well, that's fascinating. I, I'll bet uh, you couldn't be up here while they're going off. 
If you had headphones, you can. If you had headphones, um, you can be up here. And that's yeah. how, would you test equipment and things? And um, Would anybody ever be up here for any reason during an active just ring the, for calibration or something like that? No, typically we people are only up here during ringing um, to see how the bells look when they're ringing to learn okay. what's going on. Um, but, you know, to have in a performance, you need everyone downstairs. Sure. Sure. And there's, uh, there's 10 bells here, and then you're going to have uh, 10 ringers down, I guess, on a full day. Yeah, it's always one person per rope. One uh -huh. person only rings one um, bell at a time. You yeah. would never have one person ringing two bells. Yeah, that could get, that's just even, I guess, for a safety measure, number one, but then just a confusion measure, number two. Right. All right. Do most days, what's your, what's your average that you would have in a number of ringers on most days? Is there, an, does it really fluctuate a whole lot or? It it, just... So we always ring following the Sunday services mm -hmm. and ideally we would have 10 volunteer ringers and we're usually able to do that. But during the summer, for example, if people are out of town, Christmas holiday or Thanksgiving holiday, yeah. we may drop down to six to eight ringers. Yeah. Um, when we have a practice night, we usually have more than 10 ringers. So um, you would have however many people are gonna ring that method, grab hold of a rope, and we would spend 10 or 15 minutes practicing a method, then those people would take a rest, or some of them would, and then others would join in. So the Washington Ringing Society that rings the cathedral's bells, um, we have about 40 active members. Um, we typically would only have uh, maybe um, 15 to 20 ringers at, at a given time. I guess you have like a, like a group email or some sort of way that you guys kind of keep track of what's going on and who's showing up when. Right, and because we also ring at the old post office tower, that location is more convenient to some people that perhaps work downtown okay. um, and prefer to ring there and, and won't typically come here and vice versa. Right. Well, that makes sense. And these louvers, these giant louvers, um, that's what that's what echoes the sound out of here, and that's that's where the sound gets released from to the uh, to the whole city. Right. Well, you'll notice that two of the sides, the louvers are open. I see to, that to project the sound, but two of the sides, the louvers are closed in order to um, accommodate the neighbors that are a little closer to the tower. Okay. That sounds like maybe there was a vote that took place or something like that. That uh... well, the cathedral <laughs> likes to be a good neighbor. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Maybe uh, do certain times of the year, do you ever open them up for just like New Year's or something? Do you take them all off and? We don't. Um, they're closed permanently. Ideally, okay. if you know funding were to become available, um, what other towers have are louvers that have a switch where you can open ah. and close them electronically. Sure, and then, like blinds. Right, so such that people could ring whenever they want with the louvers closed and the neighbors wouldn't hear. Um, but one uh, on New Year's Eve, we do ring the bells at midnight. Um, so that's one occasion where we're perhaps less uh, neighborly, but we assume everyone's celebrating well, at midnight. Everybody's gotta be forgiving <laughs> for that. That's, that's New Year's. All right, well, Thank you very much for showing us around. Um, this My has pleasure. been an exceptional experience. I'm, I'm just honored to be able to come up here and, and pick your brain on some things. It was great to have you. All right. All right. So this is our demonstration bell. And okay. where we just were in the bell chamber is where the bell is mounted. And then where we're standing now is in the ringing chamber where these ropes hang down from the ceiling. So. Um, for safety, the belts are always in the mount downward position until we ring them up. So the ringer would pull the rope little by little. That's what you're getting that momentum up back and forth, back and forth. Right, and uh -huh. then eventually the ringer will ring it to the mouth upward position and pull the rope with enough energy that it gets up to the top, but not so much energy that one of these two pieces of wood breaks. So this is how we're able to Stand the bell. Uh, just very slowly allow just enough pressure that it, this locks it. You're not having it hover here or stand here. Right. It just finds its position very gently. Exactly. All right. Um, and this has a silencer in here, so that's why you didn't hear the clapper in <laughs> the bell. So when we start performing, um, 
we're not going to ever stand the bell, but um, the ringer will need to fully rotate the bell and get it up to the balance point without standing it. And then they pull the rope again and it goes to the balance point. Um, now, if the ringer wants to allow another ringer to jump ahead of him or her in the sequence, they may be able to, they're able to pull the rope with the right amount of energy so it gets this balance point, but no further, and it can hover there for an extra second or so to allow someone else to ring before them. And That's then they an would pull the rope. That's an amazing amount of precision. Now, if they you want... can't go too far and there's no going back. It's not like you're on a balance beam where you can go one way or the other. It's just once you cross that threshold, right? Right. There is no going back. Yeah, it'll either, the bell will either bounce back and come down and when you don't want it to, to, to mm -hmm. strike and come down, or you, you could potentially break you know, one piece of the wood or the other. Um, in contrast, if we're ringing and the ringer wants to ring sooner to move ahead in the sequence, instead of bringing the bell up to the balance point, they may bring it just before the balance point. It comes down that so much that they faster. Can, right, so they can strike their bell um, oh. a second or so sooner. Wow. And then it, at the end of ringing, we'll stand the bells and then we'll ring the bells down. Um, and little by little, the wheel will stop um, rotating completely until... Does it make a sound during this process? Do the bells no, ring we'll at put, all? No, we'll put this silencer, the piece of wood around the clapper, we'll, we'll put that silencer in there. Um, so all the bells will stand and you'll go up there put right. all pieces of wood in and then allow them to come back down. That, right, and that's what we do at the cathedral. But mm -hmm. in, in many bell towers, um, they don't use silencers at all. And um, oftentimes what we'll do is um, the band will ring the bells down in order, which is a very difficult thing to do to control the speed of your bell so that as you're lowering the bell, everyone's lowering their bells at the same speed. Uh -huh. But if Some you're ringing, swing faster than others. Exactly, because if a bell's mounted on a really large wheel, mm -hmm. it's swinging like this, while mm -hmm. the smaller bells are swinging yeah. like this. So smaller bells have to uh, make sure they don't come down too quickly. They need to make sure that the larger bells can keep up with them. So whoever's ringing the... the Lighter bells has to really have some self-control. <laughs> and it's not, and it's not all coming down at the same speed either. It's, it's because it's, it's a little bit less each time. So exactly. It, so it's, the timing changes as it, as it slows down. Right, and and mm. by the same token, we can ring the bells up in that manner, and mm. we, and we often do that as well. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So I am going to ring down that bell right now. All right. Um, yeah, let's ring it. Not keep it up in that upright position. I know that was the. Uh, right. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Right. Okay. All right. Well, let's set it down. Okay. We, what happened actually with one of our ringers, is this your phone? Yeah, I set that there because uh, we, we didn't Perfect. want to forget to put the, the bell down. So we were, we were done ringing and one of the ringers um, thought, um, she, I guess she, she wasn't paying attention and she um, made coils as if she were ringing the bell up, forgetting that the bell was already up when we were ringing them down. So when she pulled the rope, it, the bell swung and then it went upward and she's like, I don't know if she broke her finger, or spray, sprained her finger, but that, that's happened often. Um, yeah. But that's why- um, It'll just yank, it'll just go. Yeah, so that's why um, typically when you, grab hold and you're getting ready to raise a bell, you want to confirm that the bell isn't already up um, because mm -hmm. you don't want the coils around your hand if the bell is up. That's just a standard practice to always do. Oh yeah, you do it without even thinking. It's yeah. a, a reflex. So I'm gonna, um, so this is ringing <laughs> the bell full circle. And then what I'm gonna do now is move my hands up the tail of the rope, you know, like an inch at a time or so so that the bell doesn't swing 360 degrees. I'm, I'm stopping the bell in its path slowly by moving my by hands slowly. up the rope. And then with, with this tail flying around, I'm gonna create a coil. And now I'm gonna inch my fingers up the rope, ah. little by little. Yeah, you're just getting more and more of it. Right. And then I'm gonna make a second coil. 
and then I'll keep inching my fingers up the rope. And the bells, um, the arc of the bell is getting smaller and smaller. Now, would this task typically be learned by members of the church back years ago, or? Yes, um, traditionally, um, in towers with peel bells, um, usually but not always, the the bells are in um, a church of all different denominations. But it started in England, so mm -hmm. it's typically Anglican. Um, churches, um, it, it, there would be churchgoers, but um, at the cathedral, not everyone who is a uh, bell ringer is a member of the congregation. They may be a member of another congregation, or they they may not be um, a person of faith at all, which is, yeah. you know, not a problem. Um, like I said, some of our ringers ring at the old post office tower, which is completely secular. Yeah, um, but. In some bell towers, all the members of the band are active members of the congregation. In other bell towers, um, they're not really, you know, practicing. I would imagine when there was, uh, you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago, when you'd be ringing bells like this, you'd have to be that select group that would be even more tight because you didn't have cars that somebody could commute from, you know, 20 miles, 30 miles away to come help out that night. That's right. A lot of people, you're just walking or riding in. I mean, it's a much more local ordeal. Yeah. And where change ringing started in England, there's more than 5,000 towers just in um, oh, wow. the UK. So every village pretty much has a, a tower with change ringing. In the United States, the towers are more spread out. So um, we're fortunate in D.C. in that we have um, two towers in D.C. There's another one in Alexandria, another one in Frederick, Maryland. So we have... Um, more opportunities to ring, but um, where I learned to ring in Miami, the closest tower to Miami was Charleston, South Carolina. So, so you you were uh, pretty self-contained there. Yeah. As far as opportunities went. Yep. All right. Well, speaking of DC and all what's around us, how about um, while we're in here, is this the area where we can go out on the alcove yes. or the balcony? What do you call this? Is it in a what would you call this perch? Uh, is there a name for it? Or there may be, but I'm not aware. I'm not really sure. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna see if I'm bold enough to step out here. Oh, so this is amazing. This is the best view. We're the same height as that jet out there. Look at that, that is straight off, that's at our level. Well, feel free to step out. You can okay. step on that metal grate to get your footing. But that's the best view because you can see the mall from there. Yeah, all right. See you guys. <laughs> Holy cow. Oh, this is amazing. I am such a lucky person. <laughs> That's where we were filming down there. <laughs> oh, wow. This room's a lot bigger than it looks from down <laughs> on the ground. Yeah, so we're coming into the, the Carillon room where the Carillonneur, the guy that plays the instrument, or lady, um, right. has his booth here um, just over here. And then some of the bells that form this Carillon, which is a pretty incredible instrument. So this, uh, this, this booth that he sits in, there's a, there's a bench here and then the, uh, the keyboard. Correct. I guess. So he plays with fists and feet. Fists um, and feet. Each pedal on the board corresponds to a bell. All right. And so if he presses a bell or presses the keyboard, um, a hammer strikes the bell, creates the toll. Okay. Um, it has the finesse of a piano or you know, keyboard or organ-like instrument. You can play all kinds of stuff on these guys. You can. So whereas in change ringing, you're confined to the tin bells and different mm -hmm. uh, methods and patterns on those. The timing. Uh, yeah, you can't play a tune or a melody, and that's mm -hmm. what a carillon can do for you. Sure. Uh, so there's 53 bells that comprise the carillon here at Washington National Cathedral. 53. Uh, the smallest is around 17 pounds, so he's just a little guy tucked up in there. Um, and the largest is 22,000 pounds, so he's like quite a 24 actually. Yeah, 12 this tons. Is, this is like a it's like a hot tub turned upside down. <laughs> it is huge, yeah. and it's not 
which you, what it doesn't appear like from the outside is it looks like it might be thin here, but it's like it's a lot it's of bronze. It's like it's like this thick <laughs> right here. Yeah, unbelievable. So that kind of thickness and the shape of the bell gives um, gives the instrument its its tunage, mm -hmm. um, as along with the size, uh, creates those incredible songs and melodies and tunes that we hear from below. I, I'll bet that's a lot of trial and error to be able to produce a bell that large when it gets cast, so that it makes just the right sound right. when it's done. Yes, there. Are, that's why that company's been doing this for <laughs> yeah, hundreds of hundreds years. Hundreds of years. There's and the unfortunately um, for us that love bells. Fewer and fewer bell uh, foundries exist these days, so they're closing down from lack of interest or lack of finance. And so that's kind of our role is to get more bells ringing in more places. Well, you got to get more awareness out there. Exactly, so keeping keeping the art of, of bells alive. Yeah. Well, you guys are doing a fantastic <laughs> job. I'm happy. I'm yeah. having a hell of a day. Yeah. Okay. So you want to go see the largest one? Ah, uh, yeah. I'd love to see yeah. the largest one. Let's go. So it's twenty-four thousand pounds, twelve tons. No, nope, not quite no. there oh yet. My Look at that. Uh, this this uh, is amazing. As an instrument, this is the third heaviest carillon in the world, I believe. So the amount third. of bronze that comprises or composes this um, instrument, it's a lot of bronze. That is a lot of bronze. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. It's just squeezed in here too. I mean, this is a, it's, it's a huge room, but I mean, it's, there's not a whole lot of room to spare because of the yeah. top looks like. So I'd say this room's probably around 40 feet tall, if I'm not mistaken. So stacking bells on top of each other gives us a, a bit more, um, you know, room to, to bring in the, the 53 bells that are here. So this, uh, this guy is playing the um, playing the levers and whatnot. Yes. I'd say uh, that's a pretty well insulated room. <laughs> he's, he's right next to some pretty loud instruments. Yeah. 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 I'd like to see what the inside of this wall looks like. Yeah. It's a sound ending place. He's set up pretty well there. He's got air conditioning. A lot of bell towers don't. So. Yeah, this, well, this place seems to uh, you know, have everybody kept pretty comfortable. Exactly. You guys got an elevator, and AC, <laughs> and lounge chairs. And, you know, take care of, their, of our bell ringers at the Washington National Cathedral. Hey, Rob, do you want to step in? And <laughs> sure. Maybe we'll have a last little piece with you. So this, is, uh, this has just been an incredible day, guys. I just wanted to stop and say thank you so much for showing us around and taking time out of your busy schedules to <laughs> show us some bells and tell these guys a little bit more about what it is that you do. That you do. Um, I guess if people want to learn more about what it is that you do, what's a good place to uh, get some literature, get some information? Yeah, so the National Bell Festival, you can find us at bells.org. Um, there you can find a lot about change ringing, which we saw above the Art of Carillon, which is here. Um, a lot of different ways to play and celebrate bells, um, and also support the organization that's keeping bells ringing across America. Yes, please. I mean, this it's not this stuff's not cheap, guys. To, <laughs> to restore uh, projects like this, not everything around this country is in this kind of shape. Um, so definitely, definitely, everybody that gets a part, if you can lend a hand with these kind of projects, then that would be wonderful. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. All right, guys. Well, that's it for today. We had an incredible tour. Absolutely awesome day. We went through the garden, saw the cathedral, saw the bells. Paul and Rob were just fantastic with us. So thank them and thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do. That helps my videos get up the ladder in the scheme of things. It gets them in front of more eyes. But for right now, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you liked it. I'll see you next time.